All right, may as well get started. So today we'll be finishing up on metro politics, talking about the cities and so forth, specifically kind of talking a little bit more about sprawl as well as on consolidation versus fragmentation. So last time we talked about sort of the arguments against sprawl, these sort of circles that expand in terms of uh, suburbs around cities and the various types of arguments against it and the kind of things that are viewed as uh, a problem. Today, we will start on with those who, I guess you could say are for sprawl, though that's, you're not generally going to find someone who says, yes, sprawl, we're all for it, but instead you'll find people who will criticize the kind of interpretation of the spread of suburbs that they'll basically say that, no, this, this description isn't quite correct. It's not really quite apt, and therefore, mm, we need to look at this differently. Now, just like with the previous one, where there were four general sort of reasons they give, so too with this one, they have four reasons for saying that, yeah, the sort of expansion of the suburbs isn't necessarily a bad thing. And their general four reasons are affordability, flexibility, freedom, and aesthetics. Now, especially some of these tend to merge together pretty closely, but we can analytically distinguish them. So first things first is affordability. One of the big things being that cities tend to be expensive in terms of their cost of living. Um, not just in terms of like taxes, so something mentioned last time, but also just in terms of the general cost of food and especially the cost of housing. So for instance, as I mentioned briefly last time, for something like this room I'm in right now, kind of a, into some place like New York City or Chicago, this would be a studio apartment that would probably have like maybe a restroom and a sink and a place for a fridge, but all in just one room. And that would be something that might cost $1,500, $1,800 a month to live in. Versus if you live in the suburbs where you might be able to get a mortgage on a house, so a house with say two or three bedrooms and living room, other spaces, things of that type, separate kitchen, where you'd be paying maybe six to $800 a month in a mortgage, where you'd actually, at the end of it, be able to own it. That makes a pretty big difference, um, that uh, you're spending less, as well as, in many ways, getting more for it. So those who want to get a little bit more for their money will tend to move outside of the city. Moreover, and kind of connected with, so mentioned last time that planners tend to be very focused on the idea of against, being against sprawl, of trying to make more compact urban areas. One of the critiques here on affordability is the idea that many of these sorts of things that planners talk about, the kind of great strategies they have, end up making things exceptionally more expensive. Um, and therefore they might make areas more livable if you're rich, but if you're middle class or poor, not so much. That, uh, so for instance, with certain types of regulations dealing with new buildings or with housing or things like that, that can tend to increase the costs for rent or things of that type. And in effect, kind of price people out from something more. So as an example, say something like, so when we talked about centralized federalism in one of the parts of the, the federalism lecture at the beginning of the class, mention things like the public housing projects. So this is a very big example of city planning and urban planning. So the idea would be to bulldoze and get rid of, uh, say, older, poor neighborhoods and replace them with well-planned, rational, efficient high rises and apartments that would have various things around them. That would be a good, rational way of setting up a city space. Now, in the end, what it ended up doing was creating something that was a very high crime, very high poverty sort of area that tended to make the area much more miserable than what existed previously. Uh, so for say those who are more in support of suburbs, they sometimes will tend to argue that the idea of trying to make this rational plan that planners will do in cities tends to kind of forget that they're dealing with human beings. Um, so there's a phrase that perhaps you've heard at some points uh, phrase that says that uh, if you're going to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. Uh, this is oftentimes used as a phrase of saying where you're going to have to do some damage to do something better. The concern here being that, okay, the planners are kind of looking at especially poor or lower middle class families as the eggs that might have to get broken for this beautiful omelet they're trying to make, whether or not it will actually succeed or not, kind of being an open question. So affordability becomes a big concern. 
Second one is flexibility, and this touches on the idea of cars again. So for the against sprawl people, the importance of cars was considered pretty negative. For those who are more in support of the suburbs, they say that cars are actually quite a positive because they allow for greater flexibility for scheduling for individuals. So if I say wanting to arrange to be able to say quickly go from work to pick up my kids and drop them off at school or to pick them up from school and then take them to an extra credit, uh, extracurricular activity and then come back to the office and then do something else. This is a lot easier to do if I have this independent form of transportation in a car versus having to rely on bus schedules and the subway schedule and availability of taxis and all these other sorts of things. But this allows for greater flexibility for an individual to do what they want, including the greater flexibility of being able to live farther away from the city to someplace that might be a little more affordable and livable. Which then touches on the idea of freedom. So the idea is you have greater freedom if you live outside of a city. That again, you have this flexibility of being able to move about, but also you have greater input into your communities. They grow more organically. That so in a smaller community of some type or another in a suburb, I have a greater opportunity to try and influence things, say like the local government or say be involved with various private associations. I have a better chance of kind of getting rid of that anome, that kind of anonymity that makes cities um, oftentimes so, so difficult for people. But this allows me to kind of grow in this kind of community. That rather than looking at something that would be efficient, you're looking at something that kind of grows on its own, something that grows more organic. And then the final point is aesthetics. So again, this kind of idea of the American dream of having your single family home in a quiet community to raise your family. The idea here is that, yeah, this is a much more pleasant form of life. This is what you aim for. This is what you want. That maybe living inside a crowded city might be nice when you're younger and you're kind of trying to get out. But if you want to have a family, you want something a little bit more peaceful, a little less crime ridden, a little bit more again, a little more organic in a sense. So going back to that description from last time, where those who are against Spall are talking about how internal engine, uh, combustion engine is key, this castle's garage, yeah, this is more for the suburbs. But the description of suburbs as a gas-wasting, fume-choked mess where desolation is only broken by patches of high-maintenance grass and ornamental plants. For those who are more for the suburbs, they say, well, you're not really describing the suburbs, you're describing the cities. Concrete wastelands where everything is drab, dull, just almost feels inhuman, almost like you're living like an economic unit inside your own little, you know, your own little station or pod that just comes out to go to work and then come back, that you're more like an ant in a city than like a person. That the kind of description given of sprawl is actually more conducive, more correctly applied to the cities themselves, which are in effect ugly. So again, the sort of aesthetic element that oftentimes underlies many of the political or cultural divides that exist in the United States. Now, one last thing to touch on with metropolitics is consolidation versus fragmentation. So again, looking at some place like Houston. So yes, the greater Houston area is large. The actual municipality of Houston itself is more centered in. And inside these greater Houston areas, inside the suburbs, you have various other types of municipalities, Sugarland, Cumberland, numerous others. And then also you have the counties that are there. So the question becomes, is it better to have some sort of consolidation or some sort of fragmentation that exists currently? What would be better to try and make things a little more effective? Because admittedly, when things are fragmented, it tends to make coordination and especially that issue of jurisdiction a big issue. Who has the jurisdiction to make certain types of decisions? What happens if there are multiple jurisdictions laying on top of each other? So this is one of the reasons why, and again, oftentimes more with the city planner types, they tend to emphasize the idea of consolidation. So the idea being that, okay, yes, if you have the greater Houston area, you want to have the other types of communities still connected in, in some in terms of sort of more a centralized form of uh, governance. And one place that has done something like this in practice is in the state of Indiana. It's 
specifically Marion County and the city that's within it called Indianapolis, which uses something called the UNIGOV system. This is where the city government of Indianapolis and the county government of Marion are kind of merged together. So an example of consolidation. And usually the points for it are that on the four, that for public services, this makes them a little bit more sensical. So instead of having to worry about, okay, is the county going to be in charge of something or is it going to be, so again, using Houston as an example, is it going to be the uh, city of Houston that's responsible, the city of Sugarland, someone else, especially if you're dealing with like sanitation or water or power. The idea is that by consolidating, you have it all kind of centralized so you can have a more rational system put together, which I think is the second point that allows for coordination. So if you're trying to do something new with something like, say, a sanitation system, rather than trying to get permissions from six or seven different governing bodies, you just have one. So it can be a little more rational. It also touches on equality. So again, that issue that people who can afford to leave the cities and go to the suburbs oftentimes do, and that this can have a pretty nasty effect on the amount of tax revenue that a city has. The idea is this kind of helps with equality because even those who are now outside of the central city if there's a consolidated government, they're paying taxes into that consolidated government. And therefore, the types of inequalities in terms of uh, income and so forth don't necessarily have the same sort of larger effects between municipalities as they would before. Which then touches on responsibility. Because the idea is that, okay, if people are moving out to the suburbs but still working in the city, they're still benefiting from the city itself, even if they're not living in it. By having consolidation, this ensures those people are still paying their fair share in terms of taxes and other things to, to the overarching government. But there are also arguments for fragmentation. One of them being identity. So again, getting to this idea that you know, if you're moving out to a smaller community, something that's more organic, you might identify with it more. Yes, you may work in Houston, but you consider yourself to be someone from Sugarland or Cumberland or wherever else. Consolidation would effectively sort of try and standardize things. Effectively, you're saying, okay, yes, I'm living in Sugarland, but I'm having to live like someone in Houston. Where the argument would be, well, if I wanted to live in Houston, I still would live there rather than moving out. So it could kind of destroy identity. Second issue is access. One of the benefits of fragmentation is that since you're dealing with a smaller population, you have better access to deal with things. So let's say that, again, we're dealing with something like a water system, sanitation. If I live in Cumberland and I have some sort of problem with my sanitation, I call the Cumberland Sanitation Board. They maybe have 60 or 70,000 people who they're operating over. As one of those 60 or 70,000, I have a certain level of access to it. But if it's all consolidated to the greater Houston area, I'm going to be one person out of, say, maybe 6 million. My access is going to go down because now I'm just one person out of so many that they just kind of blur in with the rest. This also touches on effectiveness. So again, going to that water supply issue. If I'm one person out of a population of 60,000 and I have problems, I can call the local government. I can talk to my neighbors, so on and so forth. With a smaller community, I can have more of an impact that will encourage, to put it mildly, the water board to start acting, to be more, to, 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 to be better. Again, if I'm one person out of the population of 6 million in a larger city, my effectiveness goes down substantially. Moreover, the effectiveness of the governing agencies, the idea is it kind of goes down because they don't have the same types of pressures on them. Then in effect, if you're going to, the water company would have to be, the, the, the water board, uh, sanitation board would have to get pretty incompetent to be able to get enough of a critical mass of people inside this greater 6 million Houston six million people in Houston area to get them to pressure them to change versus say in some place like Cumberland where you're only dealing again with maybe about 60,000 people. Both of these kind of touched on the issue of influence. So again, one of the points mentioned in terms of freedom for sprawl or for uh, pro suburbs areas is that you can have more influence, that you can actually engage with your local governments. One of the benefits of fragmentation is that it allows for this sort of greater level of influence. That again, if I'm one person out of 60,000, I have a greater influence than if I'm one person out of 6 million. And that for many people, that's what they want. <laughs> they want to actually be able to have influence. Um, they want to be engaged in their local community. Fragmentation allows for greater 
individual initiative, especially for those who aren't, say, very well connected or very rich or something of that type. And then the final one, and the particularly sensitive one, would be schools. The concern with consolidation of government is that it would probably also mean the consolidation of school districts. That would be a problem. That again, one of the big reasons why people leave cities is because they don't like the school systems. That many of the larger city school systems are, to be honest, a complete and total mess. Um, so again, the example of some place like I think it was Baltimore. Uh, some of the schools there, it was revealed that you know, if you have a something like a 0.4 GPA, you would still be in the top 50% of your class graduating from high school. That's bad. <laughs> And again, one of the big reasons people often have to move out of cities is because they want they want their children to have better schools. The problem with consolidation in this view is, OK, if we're fleeing the cities because we want our children to actually be able to read, write and know how to do mathematics. What benefit do we get by being put under consolidation with cities that seem to be blatantly incompetent with handling schools? Why would we want to do that? Why wouldn't we just try and get farther out? Admittedly, if we had essay questions for the final test, these would probably be some of the things that would come in comparing these things, but I think we really don't have to worry about that. So before continuing, any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns over anything dealing with any part of metro politics? And again, admittedly, we're dealing with the cities rather briefly. Just uh, again, if we had something like an urban politics class, we'd be there. Are multiple other issues we talk about: infrastructure, budgeting, how politics oftentimes can get rather complicated in the cities. Um, issues of, say, why is crime an issue? Why uh, are there problems with poverty or schools? What are some of the causes? Things of that type. We'd be getting to many of those things in detail, but especially for a course like this. Oh, we kind of have to touch on it rather briefly, unfortunately. Okay. Well, with that being the case, so it looks like what we will probably deal with next. So the next lecture will probably be focused on political parties. So political parties as they touch on state government as well as though they touch on local governments. Uh, which will also kind of bleed in a little bit talking about elections, but of the two elections and party, uh, party politics, probably political parties would be the wiser one for us to address as they are so important for how uh, politics works in the United States, and especially at the state level. So with that being the case, we'll have the uh, lecture notes uh, that available to you again sometime during tomorrow, most likely. Um, also, we'll probably send out a revised schedule given how the schedule has already changed substantially from when I sent it out uh, last weekend. Also, once again, this uh, lecture is recorded, so we'll have that either on Canvas or if I can't figure out the technical issues with Canvas, we'll have it up on YouTube and send uh, a link to you so you can get to all of those. And then in terms of the lecture on Thursday, whether it will be in person or remote, hopefully it should be in person. Uh, we will see. Um, we'll definitely know by tomorrow, so we'll give you a heads up so you'll know what to expect. And otherwise, I will just see you one way or another on Thursday. Uh, uh, professor? Yes, sir. Uh, professor, I have a question that I want to ask uh, privately. 